The Australian Financial Review. Last week, the Australian Financial Review's technology editor, Paul Smith, sat down with Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates in Sydney. And it didn't take long before they started talking about ChatGPT. How transformative do you think it's going to be? Are we, we've written millions of words about it in the media since November, I think. And you'll write tens of millions more. Yeah. Uh, but the AI will help you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I, I'm, I'm worried about. The world has been in a spin since the experimental chatbot was released for a free public trial at the end of November. Chat GPT. Maybe you've heard of it. With its ability to produce everything from essays to poetry with a few simple prompts. Microsoft investing billions in the development. It's gained popularity for its ability to craft emails, write research papers, and answer almost any question in a matter of seconds. This promises to be the viral sensation that could completely reset how we do things. And it is how we do things in health and education that Bill Gates says there is the greatest potential. Welcome to The Fin. I'm Lisa Murray. Today, Paul Smith explains the hype around ChatGPT, why its release forced Google to declare a code red, and whether it is coming for your job. It's Thursday, February 2. So, Paul, before we start talking about this new era of computing, I hear you had a little bit of trouble when you went to interview Bill Gates last week. What happened? Well, Lisa, it was surreal is the first word you'd use. They're sitting at the table is one of the most famous people in the sector that you've been covering for most of your career. And to be honest, I got a little bit nervous. Um, We were obviously planning to talk about some of the stuff on the podcast. So I'd taken some fancy new recording equipment with me to get a nice recording of his voice. And of course, he was looking a little bit pressed for time. And I was thinking, oh, he's getting antsy. He wants me to hurry up. And so I pressed the button twice and recorded nothing. Oh, dear. That's a reporter's worst nightmare. So with apologies to our listeners, the version that you will hear of the interview with Mr. Gates is recorded on my disaster recovery device, my mobile phone, rather than with the expensive proper equipment that I was sent out to do the job with. (laughs) But it was um, a very good interview. He was on good form. We obviously covered a lot of his areas that he's been talking about for a long time, philanthropy, the environment, energy transition. But I obviously wanted to get to him on AI and talk to him about it because at the time there was lots of rumours about Microsoft being about to invest $10 billion in OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT. And so I asked him what he's been using it before, how he's been involved with it. He's been experimenting with it to see how it might be useful both for Microsoft and in his other areas of influence like health and, and education. And... Yeah, he's very bullish about it. Those rumours Microsoft was about to invest $10 billion in OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT, they turned out to be true. So clearly they see a future in this powerful AI tool. But the basic technology has been around for a long time. We all know Siri. So explain to us how ChatGPT is different. It's basically just a much more intelligent chatbot than something like Siri. Uh, It's built on something known as large language model, which has been in development for decades um, by big technology companies and academics and universities that have been investing in research to how computers can talk to us more like a human being and have conversations where you have a bit of back and forth. And that's really what chat GPT feels like. Uh, You're talking to a computer, obviously you sit and type in, in, in a way that you would be searching the web. But you're chatting with it. And so unlike a Google search, ChatGPT doesn't sort of deliver a whole heap of links and web pages that may have some nuggets of information. It'll respond to you in full sentences, which you can then investigate further, ask follow-up questions, um, dispute what it's served up and, and get follow-up responses. It's, it's quite extraordinary in that way. And it's why it's got people in, in such a spin, because it feels like a step change and, and feels powerful. So, Paul, over the last few months, people have been scrambling to test out this powerful tech. They've been asking ChatGPT all sorts of questions from the pragmatic, like, um, write me a school essay or rewrite this business plan, 
to the more frivolous. I know I was going to a White Lotus themed party and I asked it what I should wear and it actually came back with not a bad suggestion. So can you tell us, since this service has been free and available, what have we discovered? Well, we've discovered that it can do all kinds of things that we used to do ourselves and, and maybe it wasn't the core part of our jobs or our daily lives, but it's, it just can be a lot of fun and useful in daily life. Uh, I've had it write me a few news stories, um, not that have been published in the AFR, I have to add, um, but ones that they weren't too bad. You, could, you, you feed in some basic information. Um, if you were writing something up off a, a news announcement, for example, it can do a pretty good job. And things like you can ask it to write you a synopsis of a movie or a TV show. I went to see the new Avatar movie with my daughter at the weekend. And I'd, because the chat GPT is trained from data from before this year, I asked it to write a premise for a sequel to the first Avatar. And I like chat GPT's version better. Um, but it's, 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 just, it's pretty cool with what it can do. Um, and so I thought, yeah, because I knew I was going to come on the podcast, I'd, I'd ca- try and make it do something um, mildly entertaining and different. Set your, um, your cringe settings to, to maximum because I um, asked it to write a short rap um, in the style of Vanilla Ice because I've got the most up-to-date music references going on. The kids all love Vanilla Ice, I assume. Um, about the way ChatGPT could change the workplace, um, featuring a reference to the Australian Financial Review and Bill Gates. Um, so, yeah, I've got it here for you if, if you want to hear it. Excellent. I'd love to hear it. Okay. I've, I've, it's very kind of you to say that. Well, the delivery might not be on, but here we go. Here's what ChatGPT makes of a rap, AFR and Bill Gates. Listen up, y'all. I've got a story to tell about a bot that's changing the game doing well. ChatGPT, a revolution in sight, making work easier with speed and insight. From the stock market to the boardroom floor, ChatGPT's got the answers and so much more. Just ask it a question and watch it unfold, like the Australian Financial Review, sharp and bold. And even Bill Gates knows the deal. ChatGPT's revolution's going to change the way we feel. So there you go. What do you reckon? Well, I'm happy to hear the financial review is sharp and bold, Um, but that's quite extraordinary, isn't it? It's not the most compelling rap, I hate to say, Paul. It's not going to win any music awards. But what's interesting is that this chatbot has mined billions of sentences of text on the internet to come up with that in seconds. So tell us how we got here. Where did ChatGPT come from? Well, OpenAI was initially set up eight years ago, co-founded by a group of investors, including Elon Musk, who which obviously has attracted lots of headlines because he's got his finger in so many pies, but he's not actually involved in the company anymore. At the time, it was a not-for-profit organization aimed at sort of developing these powerful conversational tools in a way that everyone could use. And they changed that significantly and that made it a for-profit organization in about 2018. And Microsoft invested then significantly. And they've developed it until 2020 with these language models. And GPT-3 came out in 2020. It's been trained on just unimaginable numbers of words across the internet. It's been tweaked and tweaked and tweaked. It was finished in 2021, I think it was. 2021 is where the data is up to. And so currently you're conversing with all the learning that it could do up until that point. So what happened last November, November 30, is they released ChatGPT to the public. It was hugely popular instantly. They had apparently over a million signups in five days. Um, everyone was writing stories like we were in the, in the AFR and in all the tech press in, in the US about how it was changing the technology industry. Reports that Google's management had declared code red as it represented the first threat that they'd had in decades to their dominance of, of web search and all hell had broken loose. So let's talk about that. Because since the release of ChatGPT, there's been all sorts of speculation about what it means for the industry. Some people are even saying that this technology could mean a second coming for Bing, Microsoft's long-neglected search engine. So what does it mean for the likes of Microsoft and Google? Well, for Microsoft, um, it's obviously worth investing $10 billion in at the same time that they're laying off huge numbers of staff. So that's indicative of how important they think it is. But what Microsoft will be hoping, first of all, is that it really 
backs up their cloud computing business, which is the huge growth driver for Microsoft. So the business services that they will add that will incorporate generative AI. And in the search side of things, which is where you're talking about them competing with Google, it adds or will add if they include it in Bing, this sort of chat functionality into a search tool, which removes that task of sifting through pages and pages of links to find something relevant. And Google at the moment doesn't have that. Now, that doesn't mean that Google doesn't have the capability to do that. Google has its own very well-funded and very well-respected artificial intelligence division, which has, you'd say, their version of a GPT chatbot, which is called Lambda. And that is thought by many people to actually be superior to ChatGPT. They just haven't released it to the public yet, with the reasoning being that they don't want to damage the reputation of Google by having a chatbot out there that feeds back false information. Because that is a problem currently with ChatGPT, is it will tell you something very convincingly that isn't true. And Google didn't want to be associated with something like that. And they don't actually had a an instance last year when there was an engineer that works for Google that did media interviews saying that Lambda was basically like a sentient six or seven year old that knew all about physics or something like that. So, and he actually got fired for overstating or maybe scaring people about what Google were up to. It's interesting to note Google's hesitation about putting an artificial intelligence tool out there in the public that might not work properly. And if it doesn't, might potentially damage its reputation. So where does this technology fall short? When I went to interview Bill Gates, I met up beforehand with Daniel Petrie, who is a venture capitalist in Australia, but as he first really came to prominence as the local boss of Microsoft back in the 1990s, worked closely with Bill Gates and now considers him a friend. And I mentioned to him that when I was playing around with ChatGPT, had asked it to write an AFR story just to see just how in danger of my job it was. And I'd I'd said, well, please write me a a new story in the style of the Australian Financial Review, where a technology startup has raised $8 million from Australian venture capital fund called Airtree Ventures and generate about 300 words. And the story was, it doesn't know how to write a lead, I'll say that, but it got all the information in there written fairly formulaically more like a press release but the interesting thing that I had where, when, I, when I was speaking to Daniel was that he had fabricated a quote from him mm. and now there's two things there firstly it's quite scary that it was it sounded like the kind of thing that he would say in a press release he was very amused by it and just wanted to know that it didn't make him sound silly and it didn't but also he has stepped back from Airtree Ventures um, day-to-day operations about a year and a half ago so it demonstrated the limitation of the model it was giving you a false, false quote It made the quote up and it got it wrong. And I think this is one of the key issues with ChatGPT because it does get things wrong Mm -hmm. and it can get them confidently wrong. It doesn't tell you the source of information underpinning its answer. So you don't realise that it may have fabricated the quote. So we've talked a lot about the capabilities of ChatGPT. Now tell us about some of its limitations. That is one of the big ones. Um, a really good quote. We were talking for an article that we published in the, in the AFR about the, the limitations of ChatGPT. And it was someone that was saying, well, how are executives going to be using this? And should they be taking advice from ChatGPT or another chatbot? And should you really be a senior executive if that's what you need? Because his view was that ChatGPT has just mastered the art of bullshitting. Uh, it can say whatever you, it thinks you want to hear in a confident enough a way and it sounds feasible. And it is true. I am also a big fan of old movies. I asked it just as, a, as an experiment to, to write me a little justification of why all the best movies in history were made before 1960 and it provided me a really good answer it had Sunset Boulevard in there and all these films that I really enjoy but then it started talking about The Godfather and I said hang on this was after 1960 and it immediately caves and says oh I'm, I'm sorry yes you're right but had I not known that that wasn't it, it would have I would have completely gone along with that So the thing is, it doesn't understand what it's saying. That's the thing that it's not sentient. Uh, I've seen it quoted by a professor in the Sydney Morning Herald last week where he was saying, if you're taking medical advice from it, for example, you're not talking to a doctor, you're talking to an actor playing a doctor who can do a very convincing impression of one. And there's this problem of fabrication, fabricating quotes is a real problem. And some of the 
I guess the fears that people have of it are about what, you know, fake news and fabricating things that don't exist and creating feasible sounding news and advice that is just plain wrong. And that's an area that people will have to address and, and the companies behind it will have to address um, if, if they decide to lay off workers and trust AI instead of having humans sort of driving the ship. So it's certainly not perfect, Lisa. No way is it perfect. And I don't think anyone is pretending it is yet as well. I think if you view it as a, a useful tool rather than something that's going to replace someone at this stage, then that is the best way to think about it. But when I spoke to Bill Gates, he did have a warning that white-collar workers were under threat. There'll be a lot of angst about the fact that AI is targeting white-collar work. And that jobs will go because of this new technology. The linguistic capability where it can make, you know, help a doctor write a prescription, uh, it, you know, help somebody who has a large document like a lawsuit or a drug application or a complex research paper, uh, you know, it is going to be a much better tool than in the past. you mentioned that this technology will shake up the labour market. In the past, we've talked about AI taking manual jobs. That's been the focus. But with ChatGPT, it's really about white collar jobs. Tell us which jobs might be threatened and in what way. Well, that's right. We're talking here about white collar work rather than blue collar work, which has traditionally been spoken about in terms of automation and jobs being taken away. We're talking here about professionals, maybe earlier in their, st- in their career or mid-level professionals, whether in consulting firms or legal firms, and they're producing reports, they're producing presentations based on information that's readily available within their organisation. So they're not creating things from scratch. They're not going out making the sales. They're making the same reports week on week with different data. We've even had someone that contacted me after I wrote the article on Bill Mm. Gates and saw him quoted about jobs going to be changed, not lost. He works in executive coaching and career development as well and outplacement services. And they put a lot of content up on their websites, design sort of seminars, how to teach in corporate learning, that kind of thing. And he said to me, he used to employ two editors to help him write some of this stuff. And he simply doesn't need them now that he uses chat GPT and he's let them go. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, there's nothing sinister to it from the perspective of looking to cut people up, but it, essentially ChatGPT was able to do what they were doing before. And for in a fraction of the time and for a fraction of the money, those roles are quite obviously replaceable by AI. And that's what Bill Gates was saying is that these people, maybe their career isn't over, but their career is going to change because organisations don't need that done anymore. So that's a really interesting idea, isn't it? That careers won't end, they'll change. So tell us about some of the positive ways that this type of AI could affect the workplace and jobs. Well, in that sense, there's, there's three major ways where you can think of the type of roles that um, are going to be impacted by this. So these are the um, type of jobs where the AI can assist the worker, which is like, like developers, where they have things in GitHub, which is a, a, a code repository. They've got a thing called Copilot. And, and that sort of prompts them of what, how they might like to write their code as they're going. Um, and also, you know, maybe think of lawyers who have to consume a lot of documents and probably spend a lot of their personal time reading things, won't have to do that anymore. Then there's those jobs where AI can replace the worker, but then that makes them available to pursue something more unique. So rather than maybe waking up every Monday morning and, and thinking, oh God, I'm doing that same report again and I'm going to release it on Thursday and then be bored by lunchtime on Friday. They can actually be freed up to think creatively, do their job differently and work on something more meaningful. And But the, the, the issue that is really has been vexing people in the technology industry and across the economy is the skill shortage and there's skill shortage in lots of areas. So one thing that Bill Gates talked about was the medical realm where there's large parts of the world where people can't get medical advice. And, you know, it's not like we have 
too many doctors, uh, particularly in poor countries. It's not like we have too many excellent tutors, particularly in poor countries. And so, uh, you know, I think the tech companies, but also philanthropies like Gates Foundation will be shaping this so that people who never get to see a doctor have good medical advice or people... And they can't access education for various reasons. And, and if they have access to a computer, then maybe they can access some of the knowledge. So people who are in a you know, class of 30, not very well taught in mathematics, have a personalized tutor that gives them positive reinforcement and works at their level. Mm. So the, the potential in the areas I work in, which are primarily health and education, are fantastic. And there's not necessarily generative AI, but there's been advances in technology whereby mobile phones have been used to scan pregnant women and rather than going for an ultrasound. And, and rather than having the expert on hand, as you would if you went to an, a hospital in Australia, in some parts of the world where the, those experts just don't exist, and you will maybe have um, some AI-driven advice based on your scan that will be meaningful to you and will be able to give you some advice on what you should do that you just wouldn't have. In Australia, it would maybe horrify um, someone to think that they were going to have their pregnancy monitored by AI. But in parts of the world where it, there's just not an alternative, it, it would be uh, a significant improvement. So you can really see the huge potential there is in yeah. health and education. You can sort of see in five years' time how um, if this is trained in the right way, that it might make some very positive contributions to the way we live. But how are those sectors responding to the release of ChatGPT now? Well, the obvious example is the, the potential for people to cheat on exams. ChatGPT is the new artificial intelligence tool causing a stir, able to churn out essays on any topic in a matter of seconds. And you can't deny that if any important test involves recall and parroting back information that you've learned, then it can be done very convincingly on ChatGPT and whatever Google's is when it comes out. As we speak, some of our best educators are cramming, trying to come up with a way to combat AI plagiarism before school and university returns to the classroom Again, with a caveat that it doesn't have references, you can't verify where the information's come from or even if it's right, so you might hand in your essay completely wrong. The SA government is allowing artificial intelligence like oh, wow. ChatGPT to be used in schools despite New South Wales and Queensland banning it. Recognise this as a tool that students have access to and then begin to say how can we integrate it into curriculum because it's important to note, ChatGPT is only the first that's a vexed issue in and of itself, and I believe some schools have said that they are not going to do that, trying to harness it. You know, I don't think we can bury our head in the sand here and just think that you know, chat GPT or artificial intelligence are an overnight sensation that is going to disappear. They are here. Uh, in fact, we're going to see a lot more. I think. And you kind of see both sides of the argument. It would be infuriating for a teacher to suddenly have a class full of erudite geniuses when they know that that's not the way that they've been handing in work before, but also to just cut off students from the latest technology and then teach them in, in an environment that is foreign when they leave school and suddenly are amongst people that have been using this technology for a long time is clearly it, it is a good educational tool potentially, but also a, a tool for cheating. Um, and also there's been reports that people designing malware have been able to do it much more speedily with chat GPT. So yeah, there's like all technology, there's a risk of who's using it and what they're using it for. And it's, it's how you control it. And there's not really any way that you can. It's that same, you can't stop someone searching something better on the internet. What about the risk of impersonation? Well, this is an issue that really has been bubbling away for a long time now. And there's different AIs out there, which can you know, ape the voice of people from, from movies and from when they're their voice has been on record on if they've been on TV a lot. And then you can program them to, to say whatever you like, really. And there's always been this idea that if you can make a, a fake of, a, of something convincing enough, it will have the impact you want. For example, you could fake an email from a CEO to another CEO and then with a bit of audio of a pretend phone conversation between them, make out that there's a merger and acquisition about to happen. And by the time everyone's come out and said, no, this is fake, the, the share market's already reacted to it. So these are, there's a very real dangers, but these 
Um, they kind of existed before ChatGPT anyway, but it's the kind of thing that's going to make it easy to generate this feasible yet bullshit content. So, Paul, where do we go from here? OpenAI's new and improved version will come out at some point. Other companies, you've mentioned Google and others, are working on their own AI chatbots. So who will dominate the provision of this technology? And will it continue to be free to you and me? How will they make a profit out of this technology? Well, there's already talk about um, OpenAI putting a paid version of its products out there. So almost get people hooked, which is what they've done now, and then sort of reel it back in a little bit. But the suggestion will be that for students and um, not-for-profit organisations, they'd keep it free, but for corporates, you'd get a certain number of queries maybe. Or if you, and if you pay more, you get unlimited and you get more detailed answers or faster responses, I think they were saying. So yeah, there, there are ways that they can monetize it. And there's going to be myriad issues when it comes to copyright as well. People don't know who owns it. And if something is created by AI, you don't own the copyright. And the company OpenAI is planning to embed their work with markers that will be able to demonstrate that it has been used to create text. For example, an Oscar-winning movie occurs and they can say, look, this was written on ChatGPT. That might happen at some point in the future. And as to who who dominates it, the most realistic answer is that the existing big tech companies will be the ones dominating it. Obviously, we're talking about Microsoft owning a significant chunk of OpenAI, Google building its own highly intelligent systems as well, which will be released at some point. Amazon will be in on it too, Meta working in this area as well. So you kind of, it would be surprising if, if the existing tech giants aren't the ones sort of leading the charge. The Financial Review published a feature posing the question of whether ChatGPT is a form of magic or the apocalypse. What do you think? Well, I think it's neither. Uh, I think it's a very exciting, in many ways, development that's going to change the way people work and the way people research and the way people create. Because there is the, the sense that you can only create art from human experience or from um, f- from the perspective of the artist but there's also a growing sense amongst some people that this is just going to be used to prompt that so you're sitting there trying to write your script you're sitting there trying to write your book you have a writer's block moment you think okay how do I get this character from here to there you've got someone on your computer that you can make creative suggestions so from that kind of perspective it, it's quite exciting now, with reference to the art debate as well, Nick Cave came out and, and said, AI can't replace the experience and endeavour a songwriter brings to their craft. And he was very disparaging about a song written in the style of, of Nick Cave. And I agree with him entirely at this stage. It's capable of mimicry and, and something that sounds like it without anything approaching the uh, ability or, or the meaning behind it. From the jobs perspective, I don't think we're going to see mass redundancies anytime soon. Obviously, I work as a journalist. I'm slightly concerned by the idea that um, someone might be able to do significant parts of journalism um, with a bot, but I don't genuinely believe that proper journalism or proper creativity will be able to be copied anytime soon. If your job is to cut and paste stories from one website and put it on your own a bit different, then you're not going to be in a job because AI can do that. If your job is to go out, meet people, understand the context, find what's happening, know the context from the perspective of your specific audience and be able to explain it, I think we're going to be safe. So, yeah, neither apocalypse, but a big change. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Lisa. Here's the other big stories we're covering this week. Australia's Sovereign Wealth Fund reported a 3.7% loss for the calendar year after central banks lifted interest rates to control inflation, driving down asset prices and investment markets. Over the past decade, the Future Fund has delivered an average annual return of 9.1% against a target of 6.7%. And... Treasurer Jim Chalmers is being urged by the International Monetary Fund 
to wind back capital gains tax breaks for housing and to broaden the GST to help ease the burden on workers paying income tax. The recommendations were included in its latest report on Australia, which predicted a soft landing for the economy this year, but warned that high inflation, falling house prices and slower global growth pose significant risks. Thank you for listening to The Fin. I'm Lisa Murray with Paul Smith reporting today. The Fin is produced by Alex Gao and Lap Fan. Fiona Buffini is the executive producer. Our theme is by Alex Gao. If you like the show and want to hear more, follow us wherever you get your podcasts and consider rating and reviewing us as it helps others find us. For more stories about markets, business and power, subscribe to the Financial Review at afr.com slash subscribe. See you next week. The Australian Financial Review.